We're going to give uh, each of, the, uh, of our panelists will uh, spend a minute or two talking generally about uh, uh, their story, and uh, we'll then move into a period where we discuss a number of issues that are uh, involved in them, uh, and uh, we'll end by having some time set aside for uh, questions from uh, the audience. Uh, so uh, let's start at the end. Well, my name is Bonatine Hayes Greenhouse, and I am the former civilian procurement executive and chief responsible for contracting for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers. Uh, in that position, I was responsible for approving, awarding, and managing over $23 billion in government contracts each year. I was hired as the procurement executive for the Corps in 1997 as an SES, which is Senior Executive Service uh, member, with the protocol of a one-star general. I was hired with a very tall order to revolutionize contracting in the Corps and rid the Army Corps of engineers of the casual, clubby, and corrupt contracting practices that were the hallmark of an entrenched good old boys power structure, a power structure that stemmed hundreds of years and was the norm. Now my story centers on my courage to stand up for what was right and live up to the oath of office even when they, had, they were tremendous adverse personal and professional consequences. I risked my job and career when I objected to gross waste of federal taxpayer dollars and illegal contracting practices at the Army Corps of Engineers for no bid contracts to the Halliburton subsidiary, Kellogg, Brown, and Root, KBR, as the, or as the U.S. was about to invade Iraq. I was only doing my job, and I had the courage to stand alone and challenge powerful special interests from the highest levels in DOD, simply to protect the integrity of the procurement processes I was responsible for, and the economic interest of the industrial base of for companies such as Raytheon, Bechtel, Dyncorp, Parsons, etc., who also were quite capable of assuring the government got best value for the mission. Again, I was only doing my job, trying to ensure competitive uh, business processes, reasonable, compelling emergency durations, and adherence to the oath of office that I had taken in 1997 which was based on federal law that I would conduct the business of contracting and procurement in the Corps impartially, beyond reproach, with the highest degree of integrity, and with preferential treatment toward none. I took that oath seriously, and I believed in it, and I was committed to execute it, regardless of the consequences. However, the military leadership in the Corps and the representatives from DOD believed that the sky was falling and the only answers were KBR and what they had decided was the length of time for KBR to do the job. I would not fall asleep at the switch over the issues that could have been mitigated. Bottom line, I was responsible. Know that I do not regret the decisions that I made of the course uh, the course that uh, they set me on. I'm a person who deep, who's deeply committed to ensuring that integrity and accountability in government procurement was paramount. Thank you. Mr. Wright. Those things of money and reflecting on my zeroing experiences at the hands of our own government remind me, reminds me to share with you how particularly dangerous it is in the post 9-11 <coughs> security state with its regime of secrecy and cover-up, how particularly dangerous it is to be, right, to be right when the government is so wrong. I come before you as a free man, a free American, as a free human being. But that is not the case for the previous five years. 
I faced 35 years in prison because I spoke the truth to power. One of the most egregious charges that can be leveled against an American is to charge that American as a spy under the Espionage Act. My truth-telling was regarded by the government as a treasonous act. I did not take a loyalty oath, though. I did not take a loyalty oath to the President. I did not take a loyalty oath to the National Security Agency. I did not take a loyalty oath to secrecy, and nor did I take a loyalty oath to use secrecy as a cover for government crimes, wrongdoing, mal and malfeasance. I became a senior a member of the Senior Executive Service at the National Security Agency in August of 2001. My first day on the job was 9-11. Little did I know that by virtue of being, being an NSA, reporting to the number three person at NSA, that I would be exposed to the most dramatic shift towards an unconstitutional regime that has ever happened in this country. I was eyewitness to massive waste, fraud, and abuse on the order of billions of dollars involving a program that never went anywhere and never delivered anything. I was eyewitness to the reality of NSA rejecting the very best of American innovation and ingenuity that not only would have fundamentally protected the U.S. Constitution, the Fourth Amendment, but would have provided superior intelligence and no doubt, if it had been operationally deployed prior to 9-11 and was ready to be deployed, could have prevented 9-11. <coughs> and so I became a material witness for two congressional 9-11 investigations where I gave both significant amounts of classified and unclassified information regarding what NSA knew, what it could have known, what it should have known, and what it didn't know. Little did I know that those activities, which ultimately led to me being part of a DOD Inspector General complaint, would put my entire life at risk, divide my family, separate me from my colleagues, and have me facing many decades in prison. Never could have imagined sitting in the classroom during the 1970s during the impeachment hearings for Richard Nixon, that this country would have gone so far outside of the law. Nor could I sit idly by and watch the subversion of the very Constitution for all of its faults, sit idly by and watch the subversion of our own Constitution. Could not do that. When I had taken an oath to defend and support that Constitution, faithfully execute the law of the land. I was able to beat back the government over the course of a year plus after I was indicted on 10 felony charges. It is not something I would want any American to go through, nor would I want you to experience the surveillance that I, that I experienced electronically, the physical surveillance, <coughs> And having my life put under the highest resolution microscope you can imagine, having everything I am as a human being, as an American, peeled aside and apart, just consider that in your own life. So freedom means an awful lot to me right now. And liberty, the fundamental basis for our national security, is what I ultimately am standing for as I go forward as American. The government is currently assaulting the very foundation of what it means to be an American, the very essence of what America is all about. That grand experiment that started over 220 years ago, I fear for the Republic. I was only doing my job, which at the time was serving as a legal advisor, legal ethics advisor, ethics. 
at the Justice, Justice Department, um, and I fielded a call from a counterterrorism attorney about the ethical propriety of interrogating the so-called American Taliban, John Walker Lind. Um, I was told unambiguously that John Walker Lind's parents had retained counsel for their son. So in accordance with what we usually advise for those of you who have taken legal ethics or professional responsibility already, I advise that they shouldn't contact him or interview him or interrogate him and especially torture him without a lawyer. Um, uh, that advice was disregarded and they called back two days later and said, oops, what do we do now? And I said, look, you seal off that interview and use it for national security or intelligence gathering, but you don't use it for criminal prosecution, which is what they turned around and did. Um, not only that, as soon as he, John Walker Lind, uh, was charged, um, Ashcroft had one of his many flashy dramatic press conferences um, in which he said, the subject here is entitled to choose his own lawyer, and to our knowledge, has not chosen a lawyer at this time. I knew that wasn't true, but I didn't say anything. Three weeks later, Ashcroft had another um, press conference um, and was asked about Lynn's treatment. And he said that John Walker Lind had been, his rights have been carefully, scrupulously guarded, which was uh, contrary to a photo that was circulating worldwide of him naked, blindfolded, gagged, and bound to a board with a bullet in his leg. Um, it was our first glimpse of torture before Abu Ghraib, and we didn't even flinch, because after all, it was right after 9-11. So again, I knew that was not true. But you have that question of when do you speak out? And for me, um, the time came to speak out when I got uh, an email from the prosecutor um, saying, I have, as you know, there's a discovery order for all of the emails related to John Walker Lynn's interrogation. I have two of your emails and I wanted to make sure I had everything. And alarm bells went off because I was unaware that there was a discovery order which is not the way it works at the Justice Department. Normally, they let everybody know about discovery orders. Um, and I also knew I had written a, more than a dozen emails about the interrogation, including emails documenting that the FBI had committed an ethics violation in its interrogation of John Walker Lind. Um, I, I um, resurrected a lot of those, as many as I could, about 12 to 14 of those emails from my computer. I wrote a memo to my boss and attached the emails. I made a, I made a copy for myself in case they disappeared from the file again, which had happened, and I resigned. As the prosecution continued, I kept hearing over and over again on the radio that the government never took the position that John Walker Lind had counsel and that prompted me to blow the whistle because I did not believe the Justice Department would have the temerity to make those kinds of statements if it had indeed turned over my email in accordance with the federal court order. That was the beginning of my whistleblower journey. Um, for that, I was placed under criminal investigation. I was referred to the state bars in which I'm licensed as an attorney and put on the no-fly list. Um, and you know, that was a professional exile, but it led me to, I decided to dedicate myself to representing whistleblowers because I, I understood what they were going through. Um, and that's how I came to represent Tom Drake. Um, with the three of you talking a little <laughs> with the three of you talk a little bit about your attempts to seek resolution of these problems internally within each of your organizations? Well, in my particular case, I ran into problems of conflict of interest with the, with the contract, and a contracting officer, a person is never supposed to allow a conflict of interest. The reason why there was a conflict of interest, um, 
Halliburton had been given another $2 million, aside from the contract that I was working on, uh, to write what is called the contingency plan. It's like an economic analysis. And they defined all the budgets and all of that for the campaign that was going to go on in Iraq. Um, then, and now they were coming with, uh, once you do an economic analysis, you're not, you're supposed to sign a statement that you're not going to do any of the follow-on work that evolves from that economic analysis. That was a conflict of interest there, because they had chosen the one who had done the conflict, had done the contingency plan, refused to give the contingency plan, you know, as a document that would be a part of the competition with the other companies like Raytheon, Bechtel, Dyncor, and so on. And so they were just refusing to follow the law. So it was, it was just simply the most blatant kind of thing. So I tried to, I could not, not uh, make them aware of the improprieties that were going on. And because of that, they didn't want to hear from me. They had decided that KBR was going to be the company, and that KBR was going to have the contract for five years at $7 billion under compelling emergency situation. Now, what compelling emergency situation is going to last for five years? <laughs> and then they were telling Congress that the compelling emergency situation, uh, the contract, was simply a bridge to competition. So I said, if it's a bridge, it's going to look like a bridge. And it's not going to look like five years. So over the meantime of them trying to uh, mitigate some of the things that uh, I had thrown on the table that had to be corrected, uh, they came back on the final day, like three days before the Iraq war was going off and the contract had to be awarded, they came back with uh, um, another kind of example of two base years and three option years. Still, five years. Had I not written on that document what I wrote that brought so much controversy, you know, about them, uh, it never would have been revisited. And they would have just simply told me, you signed it, and that's that. It's so important as to what you sign and what you believe in and what you know is right and not feeling forced. Because those type of things, I could have been considered incompetent and would have gone to prison you know, for the misuse of government funding. You know, just under some, anybody could have picked up the phone and called on that. So when I testified before Congress, I said that if the laws that are on the book for procurement contracting are no longer relevant to the contingency operations that, that we're doing, you need to change them and not hold the procurement executives, whereas with the Air Force, that lady went to prison for about nine months, but I wound up in prison at the core for the past seven or eight years that I stayed on there. But at the same time, <laughs> um, those are the kinds of things. And, and then another thing I'd, I'd like to tell you about is that with KBR, they had chosen them and given me three different reasons as to why they were a sole source. But you know what it panned out to be? All of them were government-imposed uh, uniquenesses. One was the company had to be familiar with the contingency plan. Nobody knew about the contingency plan, you know, but KBR, and they got $2 million to do it. They had to know what was going on at CENTCOM on a daily basis. Nobody knew that either, other than KBR, because they had the log cap contracts that were given the logistics of clothes, the laundry, the food service, everything in support of the troops. So everything that they laid out were things that the government had imposed as uniquenesses and telling me as the competition advocate, you have to sign it. And my job was to validate a sole source, not to make it. So I sent them back to the drawing book board to give me reasons as to why this was a sole source for KBO. <coughs> And those were the kinds of things I had to write about. If I had sent it in a memo, the memo never would have seen the light of day. But I wrote it directly above my name, and that was my cardinal sin, my death snail. I had to be uh, demoted, and I had to be removed, removed from that job. 
Those are a few things yeah. that are required yeah. to pick up to tell everybody. <laughs> <laughs> but it's many, many more. <laughs> As a member of the Senior Executive Service of the National Security Agency and having been hired in from the outside with the functional title of Senior Change Leader, I certainly know that I was entering into a world that would have great difficulty accepting change. As it turns out, the the antibodies kicked in culturally. <laughs> uh, the last thing they wanted, even post 9-11, was actually change the way they did business. If anything, it actually increased and expanded the way they did business, particularly under the guise uh, of national security and secrecy. But national security and secrecy is not meant to use an excuse to fraudulently award contracts to major players who you have a close in a binding relationship with, it is also not to be used as cover as an excuse to violate the fundamental directive at NSA, which is you do not spy on Americans. We had already gone through this in the 50s, 60s, and 70s with egregious violations then of the U.S. government using its own powers to surveil its own citizens. Read the history. Read the Frank Church report. One of the great fears that Frank Church had was what would happen later with more advanced technology. Would you be able to actually turn it back, especially with such a large organization as NSA operating in secret, with, which is, means that you're under special obligations to follow the law even more to the letter. So here I am. I'm a senior program manager, executive program manager. I find out that the award of the Trailblazer Project, this multi-billion dollar contract that General Hayden had let out, that he's going to buy the solution, not make it, ignoring all the alternatives which are required, the studies which are required under the federal acquisition regs, and then finding out that the, the main contract that was awarded under Trailblazer shortly after 9-11 was done so right from the top without any actual competition. Although the veneer was put on it, the word was told, the, the selection committee was flat out told, you will award Trailblazer to SAIC. What am I also finding out? I found out that the National Security Agency was an abject violation of the Fourth Amendment under its own regulations, okay, from FISA, called USA 18 where there's very special procedures put into place for surveilling U.S. persons, that's resident aliens, U.S. citizens, and corporations, both domestically and overseas. I remember having that moment in October when I found out that, in fact, NSA had tossed aside a very carefully constructed and written 23-year legal regime. I had people coming to me saying, Tom, why? Are we doing this? Are we actually in violation? Why are we violating the Constitution? So I carefully looked at what my paths were because I realized that it was fraught with danger if I was to go to the press or to go outside of channels. I've literally followed every single channel to the letter. What was the primary need? vehicle for that in terms of law. It was the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act. That's what it was. It allows contact with DOD and uh, Congress independently of reporting within NSA, although I was also part of several investigations internal to NSA. So I reported all that. I reported all those violations. I reported where NSA had actually subverted the Constitution and its own regulations, its own statutes. So you can imagine, you know, most will say, well, why did you do that, Tom? Well, the law is the law. If, the, if there is no law, then it's just whatever you want it to be. And given the climate post 9 11, executive decisions were made at the highest levels to deliberately bypass the Constitution. And so I reported what needed to be reported. I had a reasonable belief, more than a reasonable belief, I actually had probable cause that NSA was in violation of FISA, 
from the highest levels of the government in collusion with the White House. I was specifically told that the program had been approved by the White House. This is the warrantless wiretapping program involving Cheney and Addington and a couple of others. Super secret, the full extent to which we do not know to this day. And I was also privy to contract fraud, waste, and abuse. So under that reasonable belief, I reported all that. And that's the mechanisms that I followed. It ultimately led many years later, which we may get to, is to making another decision to actually, under my First Amendment rights, to actually go to the press. Internally, internally, um, I went to my boss, who told me in no uncertain terms that she would handle the situation. And instead, the only person that got handled was me. Um, and then I also complained to the Office of Inspector General and the Office of Professional Responsibility, both of whom ended up investigating not the wrongdoing, but investigating me. And uh, when you uh, decided to go uh, to other people with uh, these disclosures, uh, did you anticipate the response that would follow? I, I had no idea. I, obviously not, no. I never in a million years anticipated that it would unleash the full force of the entire executive branch against me. No, I, I, you know, I, I thought it would tick some people off rub some people the wrong way, and so, but, but I did not anticipate that the government would spend your taxpayer dollars in a year and a half criminal investigation against me for what they would never tell me, a still ongoing after eight years criminal bar in the investigation, um, and putting me on the no-fly list, and all the other, I mean, that's just some of the more severe stuff that went on. Um, getting me fired from my private law firm, contesting my unemployment compensation benefits of a private third-party law firm, etc. Your taxpayer dollars at work. Um, no, I did not anticipate the level, the sheer level of vindictiveness um, and vengefulness on the part of the government. It became truly Orwellian and copyist for me. Here I was, under the obligation, the oath that I took, to support and defend the Constitution. I'm reporting crimes. I'm reporting massive, gross fraud, waste, and abuse. And I'm, I'm ultimately investigated, ultimately prosecuted, and ultimately indicted for that. I mean, it really, literally was upside down. I felt fundamentally betrayed by my own country. But it's important to point out a couple things, because internally, I had gone to my immediate boss, who was Maureen McGinsky. She headed up the Sig Signals Intelligence Director at NSA during this time period. She demurred when I spoke truth to her. She said, if you still have an issue with this, contact the Office of General Counsel. I actually spoke to an, one of the senior attorneys at NSA's Office of General Counsel, who later became the General Counsel, regarding my significant concerns about the path the NSA was down. Not only was I told not to worry about it, that it had been approved by the White House, which of course brought back all these reflections from the Nixon administration. Of course, at this point, NSA is already making the Nixon administration with respect to this particular set of activities look like hikers. Far more egregious and far, far more intrusive in terms of the violations that Nixon ever could have possibly dreamed of. So here I am actually hearing an attorney tell me that it's okay it's all legal. Don't worry about it, Tom. And then there's this kind of a pause. You don't want to pursue this any further. I was also pulled aside in early 2002 when I was actually a material witness for a congressional 9-11 investigation, which was asking all the right questions about what the heck had happened. 3,000 people had been murdered. Why didn't NSA, why didn't the intelligence community keep the country out of harm's way? I was specifically warned in a face-to-face -face conversation with my boss that NSA was looking for leakers. Now, they weren't looking for leakers to the press. That came later, several years later. This was leakers to Congress. And as I had expressed significant concerns, 
to the two 9-11 congressional investigations, I knew that I was under the gun. I knew that NSA would do everything in its power, and it has significant capability to figure, figure this out, who the congressional investigators were talking to. How would I be protected? What was to prevent retaliation, reprisal, and retribution? When I became part of the Department of Defense multi-year in investigation of Trailblazer and Thin Thread, a $3 million program that could have easily have met all the requirements the Trailblazer is supposed to, for far less money, obviously. Same issue. I was extraordinarily concerned about whether or not I would be protected making protected disclosures under the regulation. In this case, the Intelligence Community Whistleblower Protection Act. It didn't matter. At one point, during the 9-11 investigation, one of the 9-11 the investigations, NSA actually set up what they called a war room. A war room with a firewall network. It wasn't even part of the regular NSA network. To deal with what? You would think terrorism, right? Some special projects, special you know, issues de dealing with fighting the threat? No. It was to deal with the congressional investigation. Cop guess, truly Orwellian. Ms. Greenhouse? Yes. Well, I never thought of myself as a whistleblower. My attorney had to identify it to me when <laughs> I started telling him my story. Uh, what brought it about was uh, the general who was the uh, project manager over the Restore Iraqi Oil uh, and started with the five-year uh, contract and so forth, he then became the chief of engineers. So the first thing that he did, he came in and uh, on October 1st, he called me in for my first, he came in in July, and then he called me for my first meeting on October 1st. And on October 5th, I was given a letter saying that I was going to be demoted. <laughs> I mean, I hadn't done anything for him. <laughs> you know, he had been my, my co-worker as a fellow SES in general of the same uh, ranking. And then he said that uh, you, will, you will be uh, demoted and you will uh, uh, be removed from the SES. And so, and, and I said, well, and he says, well, you can, you can retire now and just take your SES and nothing will be done to you, but you have to leave now. And I said, no, I, I'm not doing that. And so what happened was I went to an attorney and then we sent a 21-page letter to the acting secretary of the, of, of the Army who said, poor cease and desist until there's an investigation you know, by the Department of Defense IG. To this day, that investigation was never done. And uh, it, it's, it's just amazing. Everything, just as my uh, comrades here have told you, everything that I did, I went through the chain of command. Even when I wrote the statement on the contract of document, I went to General Flowers and I said, sir, this is as the HCA, this is why I have to do this, to protect the integrity of the, of the, uh, the contracting for the core. Break, 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 break. Thanks so much for doing this. But to my surprise, to my surprise, that wasn't thanks so much for doing this. <laughs> it was seeing what was going to be next to get me really removed. So in my case, I was simply just railroaded, you know, out of my job. Because General Flowers, uh, General uh, Strzok then, uh, for the new Secretary of the Army who came in, they sent a, a report to him as if it were from the DODIG, you know, saying that they had resolved the case. But my attorney looked at it and said, this is not the DODIG signature. This is the Army IG signature. So really, they took to the new Secretary of the Army erroneous uh, material and had him to sign off on it. And the person in um, the manpower, who was the only one who they had written to demote me and he had said no, they started giving me level five, because I had level one, and then the next year I got a level five. And he said, you have to change it. Well, what do you think they changed it to? 
uh, level four mm -hmm. that needs improvement. Mm -hmm. So if you get within an SES, there's a little quirky rule that says mm -hmm. if you get two under level three performance ratings within a three year period, they can do whatever they want to do to you. So they decided to do that. Two level fours, and then um, there was the removal. Yeah. It's, it's, it's amazing. When you see that you're doing the right thing to save the government money and to make sure that things are done properly, because those companies like Raytheon and, and uh, Bechtel and all, if I had let that contract go through as it were, they could have come back and said that they were economically harmed and we would have paid and they wouldn't have hit a lick and a stick to do any work and would have paid, been paid that $7 billion you know, for that job. I was not going to put myself in that kind of situation, whereas I was going to be blamed for allowing that kind of money to be left from the government, you know, and so on. So it comes a time, I didn't know I was a whistleblower, but it was so amazing just to show you what happens at your, at your agency when they've decided that they're going to destroy you. After that letter went to the Secretary of the Army and uh, to, to Rumsfeld, and all. Then I went into staff meeting with all of my other directors and the other people who were office chiefs. And General Strzok said, I understand we have a whistleblower in our midst. <laughs> but don't worry. Don't worry about anything. The system will take care of itself. What I'm wondering, uh, hearing this kind of massive response to uh, the simplest act of responsibility, how did did you ever fear for your physical safety? Yes. In fact, I got. Uh, they decided I was staying too long. You know, they never expected me to come back demoted, sitting in a cubicle in the back, you know, and closed off from everything. So I was going through an EEO case one morning and came in at 9 o'clock to finish up the last part of the fact-finding at my desk. Didn't realize a trap had been set for me. So right now you will see on my legs, whereas I had the worst fall in my life from this contraption that was set up. And um, it has stopped the kneecap, you know, from moving. So now it's like bone and bone, and they want to operate, but I'm trying to save my parts. <laughs> but um, anyway, it, I did go through, and that's why when it came to the, the settlement, um, I wrote the commander, because it never would have gotten to the commander. They showed pictures of everybody else with all kind of strings and wires under their desk, you know, as to how it was just a trap there for everyone, not only, you know, Buddy Greenhouse. But uh, I wrote the commander and I said, this is the first time I felt, you know, that my physical welfare, you know, is in jeopardy. I want to either work from home or work from a, a bona fide site, a telework site, or be moved to another agency. They decided they didn't want to do that. So they said that we are going to have to top settlement, you know, here, because we are not going to do that. And that's when no, no sign of settlement was ever going on. And then also my case was coming up to court, you know, in July beginning. And they did not want to go to court because they knew they could not win that case. The, um, your, um, uh, once uh, uh, these things happened, uh, what was your plan? Where, do you, where did you go for support? Uh, who did you appeal to? Who helped you? Uh, how did you begin to come out on the other side of this? For me, I had three different attorneys. I had an employment attorney who was dealing with the fact that the government was leaning on my private law firm to fire me, and I was uh, had made it clear to the government I was a whistleblower, so they could not fire me. There was a, um, an exception to the employment at will doctrine that you can't fire someone for blowing the whistle. So I had my employment attorney. I went to a criminal defense attorney and I had a constitutional attorney. Um, and I reached, I did reach out um, to a number of organizations um, that are supposed to support whistleblowers, but none of them were. It, it seemed kind of too, it was right after 9-11, it was too 
high stakes. Um, no one wanted to take on uh, the case. In terms of my physical safety, I'm, um, I'm under a gag order, and so I've given a copy of that gag order to my trust in the state's attorney and said that if, if anything ever happens, he needed to make it public. What do you ask brings up something very sobering uh, for me. Where do you go? Remember, I, again, this is what's so Kafkaesque about this. I followed what was required to follow uh, as a senior executive of the government with respect to the Whistleblower Protection Act for the Intelligence Committee. I had great fear that I would be compromised and co-opted as a result of my cooperation with two 9-11 investigations as well as the UDIG investigation. I knew that there was a risk that they could, remember one of the things about being an NSA is that in order to remain employed there, you have to have an active security clearance. And the security clearance NSA is of a very tall order. It's far beyond what a normal secret level clearance is or even a top secret, it's actually above top secret. And because it was an above top secret clearance, special compartments, they call it SCI, special intelligence, you can't remain at NSA if they decide they don't trust you anymore. Remember, it's post 9-11. It's now the 2006, 2007 time frame where I was under active inve criminal investigation by at least five full-time prosecutors and 25 full-time FBI agents. I was literally targeted as being the ringleader for something I had nothing to do with, interestingly enough. Although I had contact with a reporter, that was only a triggering event. They really thought that I was the source at NSA in collusion with others. They used, actually used the word conspiracy during the first two years of my case that I was in conspiracy with others to share highly classified information with the New York Times, and that I was the source, a primary source, but the source for what became the article published in the New York Times by James Risen and Eric Lickwell, revealing publicly for the first time the existence of the so-called warrantless wiretapping program. So here it is, it's 2006, 2007. All this is in motion. Uh, I'm now, I've resigned from NSA, where do I go? Because all of the internal systems, all the external systems have utterly failed, right? I'm totally exposed. So in April of 2008, right as I was resigning, with no adverse action, by the way, noted my personnel record, interestingly enough, I uh, went to uh, a private attorney. Private attorneys, especially in D.C., particularly in the national security arena, are not cheap. I had one of the best. I had one of the best for two years until I ran out of money. I spent just this side $100,000 before I was even indicted. And I was told by my attorney at the point that it became clear the guard was moving to indict me, with 10 felony counts, including five under the Espionage Act, that to defend myself privately would be would cost me on the order of one to three million dollars. Just by way of comparison, Oliver North, back in the 80s, spent six million defending himself. I did not have one to three million. And although I was earning a six-figure salary as a member of the senior executive service, and even if I, and I was living in a middle-class house in Western Howard County, Maryland, that would come nowhere near. I could barely muster, you know, three or four hundred thousand at most if I cashed everything in. I also ended up, you know, so what do you do? Where's the protection? Where do you go to? I'm now indicted. I'm already behind the eight ball. The government broadcast all kinds of things early on about why what I had done was so egregious. They clearly coming after me with everything they had. So I spent two years with an attorney and I ended up, because I ran out of money, I qualified as indigent, indigent, literally indigent. 
the only represent there's a long story here, but the only representation that ultimately I qualified for being indigent was casting my lot with the Maryland Federal Public Defender's Office. But I knew that having criminal defense representation would be insufficient. This is April. I was booked, I was, you know, I got my mug shot, I was fingerprinted, okay? I enter in my plea of not guilty on all 10 charges before Judge uh, Richard Bennett up in Baltimore. But I knew, and my other, my original attorney chose to remain and available to support my situation. He had the most knowledge, the most intimate knowledge of what had occurred with me. But I knew that was not sufficient. But I had, remember, I had colleagues no longer talking to me. I've, I've run out of money. So I knew I had to find some way to also, also have a voice in the court of public opinion. It was going to be insufficient to only work this on the criminal side because the government has so much in their favor already. So that led to, um, there's a long story, that led to contacting uh, Jesslyn Raddick at the Government Accountability Project. And I also see that the president of the um, Government Accountability Project is in the audience. Um, incredible advocacy and outreach and support both in front of the scenes, behind the scenes, it made the crucial and telling difference in the end. With both alternative media and the mass media speaking about the First Amendment, 99% plus by the time we got into the late spring time frame of 2011, we're all breaking in favor of what the government was doing against them. That the government did not have a case, it was utterly bankrupt, and they were simply going after me because I expose criminal okay, wrong, wrongdoing and, and malfeasance. Well, in my, in my case, uh, they did take away my top secret SCI uh, clearance. And when that happened, I uh, put in an EEO complaint against that. And the judge, my, the, uh, Judge Sullivan, had said, you will have to explain when you get to court you know, talking to the Army. She has done nothing to violate any security, you know, regulation. Why are you taking it away? The reason why, the reason that they gave for taking it away was that I had been removed out of the job and they had given me new performance standards that did not require the top secret security clearance. <laughs> Government imposed. They removed me from the job. They put me in another job where they would not allow me. At that time, Katrina was going on, and um, I could have been, I'm from Louisiana, I could have been a lot of help and wanted to help, you know, with that. But they were making sure that I, that I could not hear anything that was going on in the engineering and construction group, group that they had placed me with. But they took that security clearance. All of that they were going to have to face in court. They knew they did not have reasons for it, and that, that's what helped to bring about the settlement. I went through the National Whistleblower Center uh, with Michael Cohn, who was my lawyer there, and had it not been for all of the interns that they had doing all of the research and so forth, and bringing up um, you know, good positions you know, before the judge, uh, it never would have gone to the center.